had to bless my food. Okay, no problem. Um, so I knew that back then, because I wasn't, there was no way I was having sex at 11 years old. That shit right. was not going down. Um, but I knew she was having sex with him. And I think that's what he wanted from me. But that wasn't going to happen. But I, I figured out at an early age the power of the pussy. Okay. <laughs> that's, like, that's, a, that's a good lesson to figure out. Right. And But then I also knew that, like, oh, okay. The same way that guys treat girls, I can do the same thing. Like, just, you know, they can be a piece of ass. Okay. Did you and Hector ever end up? Mm-mm. No. Okay. So after high school, um, your dad is not really there on a consistent basis throughout high school. Uh, What about after high school? What were your plans? I wasn't consistent. Okay. So would you say you were used to, based on the relationship with him, you were used to accepting inconsistency? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Hence why I married Sherman. Okay. <laughs> that's a consist. That's a consistent. He's in- he's consistent with being inconsistent. Hmm. Powerful. So how was the re- so how was the relationship after high school? What did you do after high school, and what role did your dad play in that? Um. Ma'am. So my mother moved us to Arizona, and so I was used to him not being around, not seeing him and whatnot. So it was, I mean, once he was gone at that point, once they divorced, him being a a, a constant presence in my life was a null and void situation. That just wasn't going to happen. He was there when he was there, if he could be there, and then he wasn't when he wasn't. So there was, there wasn't ever any consistency, and there wasn't really a relationship. The race, relationship that we have now is more consistent. Okay. So bring me back to, so after high school, you accept the consistent inconsistency, mm-hmm. and then take me from there to where you're moving him in, in with you in your sounds like your early twenties. Mhm. Okay. So what happened? Um. Well, Adina Howard came to, into play, and when I had the money to move him out to Las Vegas, I moved him out to Las Vegas, um, and I really honestly don't even know how that came about. I think I just wanted him to get out of that environment because I knew it was an unhealthy environment. And I also think that, you know, subconsciously I wanted to have a relationship with him. So moving him out to Arizona was, not Arizona, to Las Vegas was, um, I thought, one of the best ways to do that. Okay. And he lived with me for a little bit until I couldn't take it anymore, and I put his ass back on the bus. Okay, so let's not fast forward through the emotion, because sometimes you do that. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I do that a lot. (laughs) Okay. So he came, and you're admitting that you had expectations of, like, him showing up again as the hero that he once was to reclaim his position. I don't know if that's what it was. That sounds good, though. Well, what do you think it was? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I what just, you know, I, it's, you I don't think I had any. And if I did, I wasn't aware that I had any expectations. Okay. So I what think at this point, I think I was trying to be the superhero. Okay. So now you're trying to save him. Right. Okay. And so what are some of the real life situations that happened that you were like, okay, I can't. What was it, what was the humanity the 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 because it seems like he was kind of like a character at one point. So what were some of the things that 
you felt like you could just not deal with? His ass hoish ways. <laughs> okay. He was just, you know, my dad is, he's a special one. Um, it was, what did he do? What did Byron do? Um, I think the one day, let's see, because I moved him, he moved out to Vegas a couple times. I moved him out a couple times, let's see. I think it was just his attitude, his um, blatant disrespect and trying to uh, just control a situation that, in my mind, honestly, was like, dude, you don't have a pot to piss in and the window to throw it out of. How are you just not taking full advantage of the situation, yet taking advantage of the situation? Um, I think, and, and again, I, I tend to, like you say, I skip, you know, over emotions or whatever, and I think that's, the, I, that's when I erase a lot of shit. Mm-hmm. So what I do remember is one day waking up and he was, still home from work. And he said he woke up and said he had a headache. And I was like, okay, that's cool, you know. And then all of a sudden I started seeing him drinking because that's one of the things he he did addiction transfer. So he wasn't, when he was with me, I didn't see any of the other, I didn't see the hard drugs, but he would go through some paps, blue ribbon and a heartbeat. And um, he just, he stayed home, said he wasn't feeling good, started going through a case of, of beer and having a conversation with this broad. And that right there for me pissed me off. I was like, hold up. You said you weren't feeling good, but you here at the house drinking up beer and talking to some bitch on the phone. No, nah, you need to go ahead and get your ass ready. That's about to basically either get up and go to work or I'm going to put your ass back on the bus. And so it was just those, you know, those things. It's like, okay, you're you're not really, you're not doing what you need to do to get on your feet. And I'm not here to take care of you like that. I'll help, but I'm not here to, you know, to be taken advantage of. Okay. Do you feel like you were standing, you were standing up to him in a way that you never did as a child? Oh, yes. In terms of expressing that which you must have suppressed? Hold on a second. Grab up a nose. Say that last question again. So I was saying, do you feel like you were expressing some of the things you might have suppressed as a child? Most likely. Okay. So did that result in him leaving? Um, not right away, and there um that I can recall. I'm trying to okay. think because I remember the apartment that I was in when we had the issue. So then I remember another time where I had to have a, um a heated conversation with him about disrespecting my mother under my roof. Okay, and so. So you can't remember the conflict, why he left the first time? The first time was, I know the first time was because, (laughs) I think both times was because he was disrespectful and he just didn't get it. You know, he had ended up, I know one time he ended up losing his job or jobs because of his mouth. You know, he's very outspoken and Again, Byron Walker's fearless, so he had no problem. Boy, he would get, and I'm going to put it this way, if they were doing back in the early 90s what they're doing today with the Me Too, his ass would be in a lot of trouble. Okay. Because, you know, not so much touching women, but you remember how you said with about the dress, like, oh, nice dress, and someone was like, took it as, oh, nice dress. Yeah. You know, that would be that would be Byron Walker. That'd be my pops. 
you know, because he always, his thing was, yeah, baby, she got a taste for me. And be like, daddy, hey, don't nobody got no taste for no snag tooth nigga. Like, you ain't got no teeth in your mouth. You ain't got, you know, a pot to piss in and the window throw it out of. Don't nobody want you like that. Not somebody who got some sense. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and daddy, he would get that kind of conversation. Okay. Like, everybody don't want you. You are not that fly, bruh. So the first time you left Ben would have been because of some of those repeated concerns or behaviors that you were just, like, not trying to deal with. Right. But you don't remember the specific blowout of what it was. You just know that it was something to do with that feeling. Yeah, I just I just remember I remember the, the first time it was, like you said, it was that feeling of just, okay, you, you're really not doing what you're supposed to do. And I'm not about to have you live off of me. Okay. And I think the second time when he came back. What made br- you give him a chance the second time to come back? Um, because he was in a situation where, uh, well, uh, from what I'm told, you know, I believe the story that he was, you know, in a, I think it had everything to do with his drug abuse. He owed money. And, um, the situation got it was dire. Okay. And I believe it was a life or death situation. It was like, okay, let me get your ass up out of there. You okay. Who who who's debt? You know, who do you owe money to? And let, let's get you out of there. Okay. Playing superhero yet again. All right. And was there any visible change that you noticed between him coming Hell the first no. time? No. Okay. All right. You don't even need but, to get that question now. Hell no. He was you just being Byron Walker. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> and was there a third? T- what What happened while he left the second time? Um, that the, the second time, um, I had really. It's, it's crazy because I had seen at this point in time, I had I was staying with my sisters. And I was sleeping on their sofa. This shit had just started falling apart, you know, and being you in a house. Him? Huh? And you brought him there? Um, I think at some point, this was be, at, there was a transition at some point where it all happened, where he was already, he was there because he was staying with my sister. Because I had um, three of my sisters, were, we were all staying in, in Vegas at the time. And so one of my sisters, my sister Love, a.k.a. Clover, um, she had her own place, and she had my my nephew. And then London and Portia, I was living with them. Um, And so when he came out, I believe I brought him out the second time. But he ended up living with Clover. But okay. that was that particular time, that second go around, that's when I saw, that's when it was confirmed that he was an addict to me because he had been asking, he had just gotten paid and I had given him some money because he needed my bank account to um, cash his check because he didn't have a bank account. So... He would give me his checks, and I would deposit his checks, and then I would, you know, give him the money that he needed. So he would, um, I gave him money on that payday, and then he kept calling and asking for $20. That's the magic number for addicts, $20. I don't know why, but $20 is the magic, the, the magic amount. And he kept calling and asking. He was like, I need, you know, I need $20. I need $20. I was like, Daddy, I just gave you some money. Like, what do you need the money for? You know, where'd the money go? I need $20. I'm trying to flip it. I'm like, you trying to flip it? He was like, yeah, I'm trying to flip it. I need $20. And I was like, what in the world are you talking about? So, like, he was very adamant, and we lived in a gated community at the time. And he found his way.